Good afternoon. Uh, today's talk is being co-sponsored by the European Security Initiative and the Russian Power and Pro Purpose Project, both at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation. We've seen over the past several years how Russia has conducted cyber operations against the United States, against European countries, and against other states around the world. And these include disinformation operations, election interference, and infrastructure attacks. Uh, and for the Kremlin, these represent a relatively low cost option. It doesn't cost much to conduct these kinds of cyber operations. And because of the difficulty of tracing the source of the attack, these kinds of attacks offer plausible deniability. And these are reasons that contribute to some of the difficulties that the West and the United States have had in responding to these Russian cyber operations. I'm delighted that today to talk about both Russian cyber operations and some of the difficulties that the West has in responding to them we have Dr. Scott Jasper with us. He is a lecturer at the Institute for Security Government and the National Security Affairs Department at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, where he spent considerable time thinking about these issues. Dr. Jasper has a PhD from the University of Reading in Great Britain, uh, and he's a retired US Navy captain. And also he's the author of the just released book, Russian Cyber Operations, Coding the Boundaries of Conflict. Uh, he'll speak to us for about 35 to 40 minutes with a PowerPoint presentation, and then we'll open it up to questions, again, submitted on your Q&A function. So Scott, over to you. Well, thank you, Amelie, for hosting today, and for Steve, for your kind introduction and the moderation later of the questions and answers. I would like to begin by also thanking the European Security Initiative and the Project on Russian Power and Purpose for sponsoring this talk. Quite a pleasure to present today on the topic of countering Russian cyber operations at the boundaries of conflict. The Russian Federation's national security strategy signed in 2015 declares that one of the country's long-term interests is consolidating the Russian Federation status as a leading world power. The ambition of President Putin and that of his trusted circle is for Russia to resume on its own terms what they decree to be a rightful geopolitical position. To achieve this status, Russia competes against the United States and its allies and partners across political, economic, and military arenas using technology and information to accelerate these contests. In 2017, the U.S. national defense strategy asserts that Russia is using areas of competition short of open warfare to achieve their ends. For example, information warfare, big areas are denied proxy operations and subversion. 2015 and 2019 in Poland, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo proclaimed that Russia has grand designs of dominating Europe and reasserting its influence in the world stage. Vladimir Putin seeks to splinter the NATO alliance, weaken the United States, and disrupt Western democracies. Cyber operations are merely a non-military means for Russia to obtain these political goals and objectives. They have become a central aspect of Russian forms of conflict and cooperation. The United States intends to work with like-minded partners to attribute and deter their malicious activities. The problem is the Kremlin is adept at cyber operations that avoid thresholds for robust responses. The Russians use technical uncertainty and legal ambiguity to evade consequences for covert actions that routinely fall below the level of armed conflict. Reemergence of long-term strategic competition challenges the prosperity and security of the United States and its allies and partners. According to General Scaparati, the commander of U.S. Central Command, Russia is engaged in strategic competition by pursuing a strategy that undermines the international order. Russia does this within the system by exploiting its benefits while simultaneously undercutting its principles and rules. As revisions power, Moscow wants to revise the status quo by actively shaping a world that opposes U.S. values and interests. The Russian government perceives itself to already be in a war with the West, led by the United States, albeit one conducted by non-military means. In Putin's blunt speech in Munich in 2007, the Russian president accused the United States of imposing an unacceptable unipolar world model characterized by an, a uncontained hyperuse of force and a greater disdain for the basic principles of national law. Putin openly demanded that Russia, with the privilege 
to carry out an independent foreign policy, be given a leadership position in making international policy. The following year, Russia exerted this privilege by invading Georgia, and then later Ukraine, using cyber operations as a new component of warfare. Russia will use all means to shift the hierarchy of authority and prestige. Moscow has tried to shape international views on state conduct in cyberspace through participation in multinational forums, although at the same time, the Kremlin uses cyber operations to advance national interests, even if they undermine or circumvent established norms, responsible state behavior. The Russians exploit legal regimes to avoid thresholds and classifications that prompt to justify meaningful responses. Their cyber operations take advantage of the ambiguity in what constitutes an armed attack, which gives states the inherent right to use force in self-defense under Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations. According to the Talon Manual 2.0, shown here, the threshold for an armed attack is measured in the scale and effects of the cyber operation. The international group of experts that wrote the manual agreed that a cyber operation that seriously injures or kills a number of persons or that causes significant damage to or destruction of property would satisfy the scale and effect requirement. They also concluded that cyber operations for intelligence gathering or theft, as well as for a brief interruption of non-essential cyber services do not qualify as an armed attack. However, numerous cyber operations that fall below the thresholds of armed attack are considered to be an internationally wrongful act, which is defined by Rule 14 in the Talon Manual as an act or mission that both constitutes a breach of international law obligation applicable to the state as in tributable under national law. The breach of an obligation may consist of violation of treaty obligations or customary national law, which include the respect for sovereignty, Rule four in the manual, the prohibition of intervention, rule 66, and the prohibition of the use of force, rule 68 in the manual. The second condition is problematic to determine, for in the clearest case, attribution is when state organs, such as the military or intelligence agencies, commit the wrongful acts. However, cyber operations conducted by a person or group of persons are attributable to the state only when acting on the instructions of under the direction or control of that state in carrying out the conduct. The U.S. Department of Defense Law of War Manual, seen on the right side here, delineates that cyber operations may constitute the third category of use of force if they cause effects that if caused by traditional physical means would be regarded as use of force. Although the manual provides somewhat extreme examples, such as cyber operations that trigger a nuclear power plant, or open a dam above a populated area, causing destruction, or disable air traffic control services resulting in airplane crashes, or that cripple military's logistics system. Russian cyber actors employ technical means for intrusion, invasion, deception to maintain anonymity and avoid attribution. Examples of their attack vectors or methods for intrusion into an information asset are phishing individuals, using stolen credentials, or posting water holes, as you see here. For instance, during the 2017 bad rabbit attack, visitors of Russian language media websites fell for a fake pop-up to update the Adobe Systems Flash multimedia product, which resulted in the download of the malware. The Russians employ sophisticated techniques for invasion, such as fileless malware attacks, which do not write executable files to a disk drive, which means they cannot be detected by antivirus software. Instead, the Russians leverage stolen credentials, remote logins, and trusted legitimate processes running on the operating system, such as Microsoft Macros, Windows Management Instrumentation, or VMI, and PowerShell. PowerShell, the scripting language, can be used to inject and execute payloads directly from memory or run malicious scripts for command functions. 2019 CrowdStrike, a security firm, observed that 51%, more than half, of attacks were malware-free, up from 40% the previous year. For deception, the Russians attempt to mislead, misdirect, and misattribute. For example, during the 2018 Winter Olympic Games, Russian hackers from the main intelligence directorate, the GRU, 
use North Korean IP addresses to make an attack look like the work of North Korean hackers. The Russian also employed proxies to divert or take the blame, normally found in patriotic hackers, criminal organizations, or advanced persistent threat groups. So let's look at an example of technical uncertainty and legal ambiguity. Here before you is a picture of an energy distribution company in Ukraine. One of three that in December 2015 experienced unscheduled power outages, the three of them within 30 minutes of each other. External hackers had remotely accessed their control centers to open breakers at 30 distribution substations, causing more than 225,000 customers to lose power. The conclusion of the onslaught, the hackers wiped computer systems with kill desk malware. The companies had to move to manual operations and were able, fortunately, to restore services in several hours. The attacks actually had begun in the spring. The spear phishing campaign that targeted information technology staff and system administrators and multiple electrical distribution companies throughout Ukraine. The phishing emails, which appear to come from a trusted source, contained Word documents that were weaponized with Black Energy 3 malware. When workers clicked on the attachment, a pop-up alert asked them to enable macros. The download of the malware, which connected to a command and control channel. The hackers mapped networks and moved laterally across to find Windows domain controllers and harvest workers' credentials to eventually, to eventually log in by VPN remotely to the control networks to execute the actual attack and shutdown. The scale and number of customers, the effects, and the duration of the restoration of the cyber operation would probably not reach the threshold of severity to qualify them as armed attack. At most, this cyber incident was a violation of sovereignty and then infringed on the state's territorial integrity and interfered with data and services that are necessary for the exercise of inherently governmental functions. However, the violation did not meet both conditions to qualify as the previously described internationally wrongful act. The cyber threat intelligence firm iSight partners blamed the Russian hacking group known as Samworn for the outrage, which supposedly Samworn has some affiliation with Russian government, although alignment with state interest does not prove state support. Therefore, without proof that the Sandworm operated on behalf of the instruction of, direction to control the Russian government, countermeasures by Ukraine were not justified or allowed. So Russia, it sees the United States and its NATO allies as a roadblock to achieving world power status and the respect the state deserves. The international sanctions regime from the Crimea incursion hinders the Russian economy, roughly the size of Canada and dependent on the volatile price of oil and gas. Meanwhile, the population will decline by 2.5% by 2030. The inability to field a large modern military results in the novel use of forms of warfare, including asymmetric, hybrid, and information-based, to reestablish and demonstrate dominant power. President Putin, Putin has falsely accused the West of preparing a color rev revolution to overthrow the Russian government, primarily through unjust and illegal sanctions. Therefore, one of his core foreign policy objectives is to constantly confront the West and break their unity in collective defense arrangements and in the faith of Western societies in their governments and democracy. The NATO alliance's buildup of military forces near Russia's borders seen as a direct threat to its national security. The 2016 foreign policy concept portrays a crisis in relations between Russia and the Western states, from geopolitical expansion and perceived containment. In response, Russia seeks to restore a privileged sphere of influence over former Soviet nations on its periphery under an erroneous view of limited sovereignty in small states. This drive includes the fraction of weaker states to establish ge geographic depth and also intervening to protect Russian minorities abroad from discrimination. Moscow is in no position to fight a major war against the West without escalating the nuclear weapons. Therefore, emphasis has been on less expensive and asymmetric weapon systems, many of which have been recently demonstrated in Syria. Its asymmetric arsenal also extends to non-military means, such as cyber operations. The first display of cyber operations as an asymmetric component of warfare 
was in the Georgian conflict in August 2008. As Russian ground troops invaded South Ossetia through the Roki Tunnel, Russian hacktivist forums posted lists of Georgian sites for patriotic hackers to attack, along with instructions and downloadable malware. The main phase of the operation began when at least six command and control servers managed by a cyber crime group struck in a massive distributed denial of service attack. Among those targeted were the Georgian president, the central government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Defense, and popular news outlets, such as the television station R2. TBC, the largest commercial bank of Georgia, eventually came under attack. The website of the president was defaced with a slideshow depicting doctored images showing Mikhail Shakonsvili and Adolf Hitler. The concerted distributed denial of service campaign constrained the ability of the Georgian government to convey its narrative in the early stages of the conflict to the national community, while Russia saturated the news media with a propaganda campaign. Although the cyber campaign had little effect on conventional forces, it achieved the psychological effect of isolating the nation. The methods used against public and private targets in Georgia were similar in nature to those seen in Estonia the previous year. A report by the U.S. Cyber Consequence Unit, an independent nonprofit research institute, concluded that cyber attacks against Georgian targets were carried out by civilians with little or no direct involvement on the part of the Russian government or military. However, the timing of the attacks indicate that the organizers had advanced notice, the right scripts, register new domains, and host new websites, well before the public was aware of the invasion by air, land, and sea. Well-known article written in 2013 by General Valery Gersimov, the chief of the general staff, identified the importance of non-military tools in conflict. His views on the changing nature of war became known in the West as the Gerasimov Doctrine. Gerasimov described new developments as a new adaptive approach to the use of military force. He said that in the 21st century, there is a tendency to erase the differences between the state of war and peace. Wars are no longer declared, but when they do begin, they do not follow our usual pattern. As Gerasimov illustrated in this chart, War is now conducted by roughly four to one ratio of non-military and military measures. However, you see Bob is espousing what he thought the West was doing as much as he was prescribing a strategy for Russia. The Russians had watched the perceived roles that Western agencies played in fostering social movement revolts against regimes in the color revolutions in Georgia, Serbia, and Ukraine, and during the Arab Spring, especially in Libya. Your CMOD was just repeating observations on the characteristic features of contemporary military conflicts, expressed in the 2010 military doctrine as the integrated utilization of military force and forces and resources of non-military character. He invented nothing, but took hold of beliefs spread among the Russian military elite and also espoused in military doctrine in 2010 and a year later in 2014. Russia had been receptive of changes in war, in particular scientific applications and social forces, and had used them in its own advantage. The aftermath of the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, the idea of hybrid warfare, quickly gained prominence as a concept that could help to explain the success of Russian military operations. The term hybrid in military affairs implies the coordinated and combined use of variants of warfare. The term uh, the construct of hybrid warfare seemed appropriate to explain how Russia's approach differed from previous, less successful wars, such as in Chechnya and even Georgia. Russia does not formally recognize this Western concept of hybrid warfare, even though the term exists in Gib Renaya Voina. General Gersimov did comment in a 2016 speech for the Academy of Military Sciences that in modern conflicts, the methods of struggle are increasingly shifting for the integrated application of political, economic, information, and other non-military measures implemented with reliance on military force. These are the so-called hybrid methods. NATO has not relinquished the term, it's even created a center of excellence for hybrid threats. Lieutenant General Karkarpothol, head of the main operational directorate, said there are the Euromaidan uprising on the left-hand side here was the result of the Western use of so-called hybrid actions. 
namely information means the formant internal conflict in order to prevent another color revolution leading to another government takeover president putin authorized the crimea operation under the guise of protecting the lives of russian speaking minorities the operation seemed to follow the gearsi mob doctrine to include the use of information confrontation measures and the actions of special operations forces called the unmarked polite people in the photo on the right side. Karada Paul Volf admitted a year later, the use of indirect actions and methods of conducting wars of a new type allows us to achieve the necessary military results. In a 2019 address to the Academy, Gersimov said the armed forces must be ready to conduct new type wars and armed conflicts using classical and asymmetric methods of operations. He stressed the importance of the information sphere of confrontation and the possibility of remote covert effects, not only against critically important infrastructures, but also against the population of a country. For instance, in the Crimea intervention, in the phase of establishment of peace on the previous chart, the Russian affiliated group Cyber Burkett compromised the Central Election Commission during the Ukrainian presidential election in May 2014, disabled real-time updates in the vote count, and then post an opposition candidate as the winner prior to the uh, official results being announced. So we talked about information confrontation and another term in the Russian lexicon in this manner is information warfare. Kyle Gears at Chatham House believes that Russia considers itself to be engaged in full-scale information warfare, where cyber activity is a facilitator or subset. Officially, the Russian Ministry of Defense has defined cyber uh, information warfare, I should say, as the ability to undermine political, economic, and social systems. Information warfare seeks to steal, plan, interdict, manipulate, distort, or destroy information. A recent report in February 2020, released by the Senate Intelligence Committee, found that in 2016, Russian operatives associated with the St. Petersburg based Internet Research Agency or the IRA, use social media to conduct an information warfare campaign designed to spread disinformation to the division in the United States. The IRA sought to polarize Americans based on societal, ideological, and racial differences. For example, they stroked emotions on socially divisive issues such as immigration and gun rights to pit Americans against one another. They used election-related hashtags such as hashtag Shirley Hillary for president and hashtag Magna, as seen here in the Russian troll account at Tennessee GOP, one of the IRA's most successful pages. The Senate Intelligence Committee determined the Kremlin supported, authorized, and directed the IRA's operations and goals. The current practice of information warfare by the Russians combines tried and tested tools of influence with the embrace of new technology. The activities are nothing more than reinvigorated aspects of subversion campaigns from the Cold War era. Soviet intelligence services concentrated on subversion using methods known as active measures. The most sub common subcategory of active measures is disinformation, which in Soviet terminology is described as a carefully constructed false message, secretly introduced into the opponent's communication system to deceive his decision-making elite or public opinion. The Russian influence campaign during the 2016 U.S. presidential election, not only use social media for disinformation, but also mass media like RT and Sputnik to spread propaganda to subvert reality with alternatives to truth. Their videos like how 100% of the Clinton's 2015 charity went to themselves were broadcast on social media, shown here on Facebook with actually 10 million views. The Russians also used hacks and leaks to interfere with the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Two state-sponsored groups, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear, broke into the Democratic National Committee or DNC network. It's widely believed that Cozy Bear APT-29 is actually the FSB, the Federal Security Service. And the Fancy Bear or ATP-28 is part of the GRU, again, the main intelligence director. Fancy Bear hacked into DNC computers through actually initial 
access to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, or the DCC. They had sent a spear phishing email to a DCCC employee who entered her password after clicking on the link. Then they used a stolen credentials to access the network and install their ex-agent malware on at least 10 computers, which allowed them to eventually capture the keystrokes and take computer screens where they could find an individual had access to the DNC network. They used these stolen credentials to enter and used word searches to find the key documents. Starting in 2016, the website DC Leaks released part of the stolen emails and documents. And in late July 2016, WikiLeaks dumped almost 20,000 emails from top DNC officials that irritated the Bernie Sanders campaign. This happened right before the convention in Philadelphia. And here you see a picture at a morning breakfast where Sanders supporters are outraged at the DNC chairwoman, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She decided not to grab on the convention and formally stepped down while protests continued the whole week. The Russian influence campaign was not an initiation of armed conflict nor violation of UN's charters, prohibition use of force. The attempt to influence the outcome of the election probably by international law, barring intervention in a state's internal affairs. But there must be two elements to be satisfied before a cyber operation qualifies as wrongful intervention. It must affect a state's domain reserve, in this case, the choice of political system, and it must be coercive by acts designed to deprive another state of its freedom of choice. While well, slanted reporting by the Russian controlled media is not coercive, cyber activities that pretended to be American citizens and the hacking and release of private data might, I say again, might justify countermeasures. We have not responded necessarily in a very robust manner in cyberspace to the activities that occurred to date. The Obama administration contemplated covert cyber operation against Russia, but there were worries over escalation after the 2016 hack and leak campaign. Participant in debate remarked, they could do more to damage us in a cyber war or could have a greater impact. Instead, President Obama signed a package of punitive measures consisting of sanctions, expulsions, and closures. The sanctions targeted the GRU, imposing travel bans and asset freezes, but were so narrow their impact was actually determined to be largely symbolic. In addition, the State Department expelled 35 intelligence operators acting on a diplomatic status from the Russian Ministry in Washington and the Russian, Russian consulate in San Francisco, giving the officials and their families 72 hours to leave the country. The State Department also notified Moscow they would lose access to Russian government-owned recreational compounds on Maryland's eastern shore and on Long Island. President Putin said Russia would not act in response to the U.S. moves in a sh public show of restraint that appeared aimed at embarrassing the Obama administration. Instead, Putin invited the children of U.S. envoys to a New Year's celebration held on the grounds of the Kremlin. Undeterred in their behavior, Russian cyber actors proceeded to hack and leak documents and emails of the 2007 presidential election campaign of Emmanuel Macron, while Twitter bots amplified the rhetoric around the leaks. Months later, in 2017, national media headlines, the United States announced a global ransomware attack by the NotPetya war. However, researchers discovered that NotPetya was not designed to process ransoms, but to wipe out data on infected computers by overriding the master boot record and encrypting the master file table. The majority of NotPetya infections, around three quarters, occurred in Ukraine. Targets included government ministries, the power grid, the Kiev airport, civilian healthcare networks, and monitoring systems at Chernobyl. The primary method for installation on victims' computers was customer updates of compromised ME-Doc tax and accounting software. After infection, NotPetya leveraged multiple promulgation methods to spread across internal networks using legitimate Windows tools and stolen NSA exploits. NotPetya moved laterally at lightning speed taking only 45 seconds to infect the network of a large Ukrainian bank. After encryption, NotPetya displayed a ransomware node demanding $300 in Bitcoin. NotPetya went on to spread unabated across Europe and in the United States. Maris, the world's largest container ship company, shown lower left, 
reported a significant interruption in business operations for well over a week. The American pharmaceutical giant Merck shut down production of vaccines for human uh, HPV and hepatitis B. March 2018, the United States issued sanctions at GRU for the NotPetya attack. And in 2018, Department of Justice indicted GRU officers and the IRA for interfering the 2016 U.S. presidential election. The Department of Treasury announced that since at least March 2016, Russian government cyber actors have targeted U.S. government entities and multiple U.S. critical infrastructure sectors, including the energy, nuclear and commercial facilities, water aviation, critical manufacturing sectors. A corresponding technical alert characterized the activity as multi-stage campaigns where Russian actors staged malware, conducting spear phishing, and gained remote access. The attackers had gone after hundreds of contractors, such as Always Evacuating USA, a 15-person company in Oregon that works with utilities. The Russian used the vendors to compromise credentials to gain direct access and to supposedly secure air-gapped or isolated utility networks. Then they would conduct a reconnaissance, move laterally, and conduct an information to industrial control systems. The chart depicts this sort of campaign. What I'm describing is the contractors are the uh, staging targets, the actual utilities are the intended targets. You can look here at the pivots between one and the other. In this case here, the Russians use sophisticated tools, as I stated before in fileless malware, legitimate processes, PowerShell and PSEC, batch scripts, and also publicly available tools such as Minimicats and Hydra, which are password cracking credentials, to gain potential control for operational systems at two dozen or more of the intended utility targets. Federal officials confirmed in July 2018 that Russian hackers got to the point where they could have thrown switches, disrupted power flows in American electrical utilities. From a legal standpoint, a series of massive blackouts could equate to a use of force until blackouts occur with demonstrative effects and armed attack does not exist. At best, there would be a respect for ruling on sovereignty, in this case, an employment of malware. The larger concern, though, is that regardless of whatever risk frameworks, best practices, threat sharing mechanisms, other measures for defense in depth were at staging and intended targets. The Russians were denied and tied the benefit of the attacks. The Russians present evolving attack vectors, sophisticated techniques for defenders to counter. In many cases, they conduct complex multiple prong attacks. So what do we do? What do we need? Let's look at this. Well, first off, we have to be able to withstand attacks. We, the United States, are allies and our partners. And when we look at the difference between security and uh, resilience, we can clarify that security means the capability to prevent an attack. The term resilience infers the capability to withstand an attack if it penetrates defenses, which the Russians have become well adapted to doing. So, endpoint detection and response technologies, such as traps seen here in a framework of the Palo Alto Network's Cortex platform protect against malware script-based fileless attacks by using machine learning behavioral analytics to identify not just exploit signatures but also exploit techniques. For example, in thinking about how this works, here you see the chart. When a user attempts to uh, run an executable on the far left side, the traps device, queries the online uh, wildfire threat intelligence service with a hash of any sort of executable file, a dynamic link library, or an office macro as described being used before. To check to see if the file is known to be malicious to Brunei. If the file is unknown, local analysis can be conducted on the endpoint by machine learning, which does not require a cloud connection. The analysis based on a model of sample trained from wildfire threat intelligence examines hundreds of characteristics of a file in a fraction of a second to render a verdict before the file can execute. If there's no file to analyze, such as in a fileless attack that manipulates legitimate processes, then across the chart, you have behavioral threat protection, such as a module for malicious process prevention to ensure a child process spawns where it should 
when it should, from where it should, and all the way down to command line examination. Lastly, traps can send unknown files to mount to wildfire for analysis and characteristics, and also analysis in a sandbox to detonate this mission and look for effects and behavior. Once a tool is determined to be uh, malicious and a signature is generated, that can be sent back out across the platform for reinforced protection. Not good enough just to understand if I was attacked, it's also required to understand how I was attacked. So another solution to Russian cyber operations is to use data correlation technologies. They can help, for example, to accelerate and simplify investigations. In this case here, you see activity scored as chain uh, of events. So an analyst can identify what happened, which process was the root cause of the attack. The tasks are executed by thread, our processes, and they're distinguishable, in this case, to determine which thread is responsible for the next event in the chain. So in this attack, you're seeing on the chart, a user downloaded and opened a zip file from a Chrome web browser. The zip application next to the script, which ran a uh, .pdf .bat file, and then PowerShell was used to create a virtual basic script. It was used by a Win script to attempt a connection to a command and control server traditionally used for instructions or to download mal more malware. In this case here, the platform Cortex recognized this sequence was an attack and then blocked it through child process protection, the creation of additional processes. Termination of live processes in a live environment allows users to continue to work without disruption or downtime. But while we have new technologies coming online in order to better defend our systems, the military is taking a more aggressive approach to dealing with Russian cyber operations. The revised US Cyber Command vision is to pursue attackers across networks and systems and contest dangerous adversary activity before it impairs our national power. By pushing defenses forward to extend the command's reach, to expose adversary weakness, to learn their intentions, their capabilities, and to counter attacks close to their origins. The concept of defend forward, as stated here, is described as an imperative in the latest DOD cyber strategy enabled by a new provision in the FY19 National Defense Authorization Act that cleared the way for traditional action, military activity in cyberspace. And it was also authorized by updated policy guidance in National Security Presidential Memorandum 13. In a matter of months and signature, the new process resulted in more operations than the previous 10 years. Colonel Nakasomi has said that states must be willing, that we must be willing to be active because an action on our part succeeds advantage to capable adversaries, such as the Russians, willing to flaunt international law and impose their own norms of cyber conduct. But it's important to note the mandate to be active risk escalation in the cyber domain. Therefore, another imperative of the 2018 DOD cyber strategy is to strengthen the security and resilience of network systems that contribute to current and future US military advantages. So what is US Cyber Command doing? Well, they're going after the Russians. Very quickly, one of the most recent operations, this was Russian small group operation by this task force that targeted Russian trolls prior to the 2018 midterm elections by sending them messages saying, we know who you are, pop-ups, emails, and so forth, telling them they were identified, also sending the same messages to the uh, Russian military intelligence. The trolls persisted on election day and for a few days after, Cyber Command took the agency's service offline of the IRA by blocking internet access. U.S. senators from both political parties praised the operation for securing the midterm election. Although the Russian federal news agency said the cyber attack disabled two of its servers, hard drives, but did not stop work entirely. Starting to wrap up, where are we at today? Well, I've given you a number of events that have occurred, incidents in campaign, influence campaigns that are against, in some cases, uh, political systems or even critical infrastructure. In the United States, 
continues to respond with a whole of nation approach in a name and shame type of operation. So in every case, the United States continues to go ahead and say that Russia is uh, to blame for operations around the world that affect U.S. interests. In the case here on the left, a massive Georgian cyber attack in October 2019 that basically took down over 2,000 television stations, uh, websites and television stations, defaced thousands of government websites. The United States blamed it once again on Russia. And on the right-hand side, the hack of Burisma uh, that occurred in January 2020, uh, again, we blame the GRU or Fancy Bear for setting up fake websites that mimic login pages where uh, attempts were to steal employee credentials with the idea of gaining discrediting information on most likely the Bidens in the run-up to the 2020 election. So the Russians continue to be at it through cyber operations. The United States strategy has not necessarily proven to be effective. The Russians are not convinced they will be punished under international law. They're not convinced that actions will fail, giving technical steps to date. They've demonstrated increased technical complexity, intrusion methods, and invasion capabilities. They are the most prolific, skilled, and the fastest of state-sponsored actors. Their advantage in cyber operations can only be diminished by deployment of robust solutions for resilience, as I've described, for example, in a market survey of technologies using the Cortex platform to withstand attacks and also to investigate uh, the various causes of the attack itself. That's a lot in 44 minutes, Steve. But I would say that if you are interested from the audience perspective, you can learn more, as Stephen mentioned, by uh, reading my next book you see here uh, by Georgetown University Press. I would like to take the opportunity here publicly to thank uh, General Keith Alexander, United States Army retired, the first commander of US Cyber Command and the former director of the National Security Agency for graciously writing the forward. I do hope that you and my audience stays in touch on Twitter and I welcome at this time any questions. Thank you. Great, well, uh, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, we've got a number of questions here, so I'll start with the first one. And this question is, does the United States conduct disinformation operations to counter Russian campaigns or achieve other strategic goals? And if not, do you think that that should be a tool that the United States should resort to use of disinformation? Well, that's, a, that's not a very soft one right off the bat. Uh, the, uh, the public information uh, is uh, limited as to the operations of the United States government. Uh, the cases that I were giving you of the Russia small group, for example, uh, were delineated in various uh, media releases, uh, most likely on purpose from the United States government in order to signal to the Russians that we are conducting these sort of operations and uh, that we will not tolerate their activity. So uh, this is new. This is a, a new way of communicating, uh, in some cases, threats as parts of the deterrence, which is what I was alluding to and very quickly as I was running out of time going through the example of the operation against the IRA. Uh, there are some considerations to using more aspects of information warfare in the 2020 uh, campaign cycle against the Russians, more of what you would term information warfare, where we might expose some of the information, for example, of some of their senior leaders or tell their senior uh, elites, uh, like the oligarchs, that we know they're involved, we know some of their personal information, almost again, it's a threat in, in that it uh, might take them out of the game. Now that's not quite disinformation, but it is more of an element of information warfare. We're using information as a weapon that the Russians, as I alluded to, are very good at. So the use of strictly disinformation, alternative messages, false messages, alternative truths, I don't think so. 
uh, I don't perceive the United States would head that direction because for us, truth is a virtue that we, of course, uh, rely on as a democratic society. And we know the Russians are trying to undermine truth and reporting, truth and interpretation of our citizens. I, I actually do not think that we would lean toward those sort of type of disinformation tactics. Oh, thank you, Scott. Let me, let me take the moderator's prerogative and ask a follow-on question, which is, yeah. okay, you, you sort of ruled out disinformation, but I would assume that the US intelligence community, other Western intelligence communities, have a lot of information, for example, on the links between Vladimir Putin and a lot of very uh, wealthy people that have these ties to the Kremlin. Uh, but we haven't seen much of an effort to put that information out. Do you have a sense why that is? I mean, I would have thought, for example, that when these operations begin by the Russians, the response might be a sort of a targeted release to Russia's social media about the wealth of people that you know, have these connections going back, in some cases, 30 years with Mr. Putin, and then with a quiet message saying, look, if you continue this sort of thing, more will follow. But I haven't seen any of that. OK, so uh, release of compromising information, uh, which is another Soviet tactic, uh, is somewhat what you're describing there. Yeah. Uh, now, it is actually documented that in the menu of topics that were considered by the Obama administration in 2016, that was on the list. OK, the obtaining of, as you're alluding to, links to uh, nefarious actors, uh, financial data, offshore accounts, uh, this sort of thing was considered. It was uh, part of the uh, array of potential actions, but it was discounted. And one of the reasons was it just didn't seem to be uh, considered to be effective. In other words, they didn't really feel anybody would care in Russia. Uh, in other words, the, the normal citizens would just say that's Western propaganda and uh, not believe it and, and not accept it. Uh, you know, Putin has put in place such a hold on society uh, that the belief is that the sanctions of the United States are, as I alluded to earlier, there to overthrow throw the Russian regime. The West has its own agenda. No matter what the Kremlin does, it's going to continue. And so Putin has used that platform to push back uh, against the West. And in some ways, I think disinformation, as you're describing, would just strengthen that platform. The Russian government would say, this is all false. It's not true. Uh, and, you know, what we are doing is uh, for the benefit of, of, the, of the Russian people, and uh, we're uh, maintaining our government uh, and our natural interests, uh, and it wouldn't be effective. And I think uh, it's the case, and I, I wouldn't think that's gonna change necessarily. Putin has his own direction with his government, his own policy, and uh, no. Well, let me move on to the next question, which really gets to the motivations behind these Russian attacks. And it's the question of the Russian strategic calculus in that these attacks you know, can do harm or potentially do harm to American or Western societies, but how do they advance specific Russian interests? So uh, again, if they can do something, for example, shut down the power network in, in uh, New England, uh, is that advancing a specific Russian goal? And this then, I think, when you talk about deterrence gets into the question where the Russians could overtly threaten to conduct these attacks and inflict this kind of harm on us. But of course, the risk then in Russia is, uh, well, not the risk, but they've actually then given up plausible deniability. The, uh, they've given up the benefit of the non-attribution of the attack. Uh, but if they then carry out the attack without sort of trying to compel or say specifically what they want, it seems that the attack is being uh, uh, carried out uh, simply to cause problems here, but without trying to advance the specific Russian objective. So could you speak to that for a moment? And I, I, I hope I've done justice to the, uh, the question posed by the questioner there. Right. Uh, well, I would actually consider uh, the categories that I was alluding to earlier, uh, so discord and threatened critical infrastructure, and I would not necessarily use them in the same light 
uh, I consider the so discord and so does I believe our national intelligence agencies to be more around public opinion and trust in our government, which is uh, demonstrated in the election interference. So uh, by polarizing the country, as it appears Russia has successfully done, uh, I would state by the divides in Congress and political parties, uh, Russia has to some extent uh, broken American society and uh, fractured it itself, uh, which is of interest to Russia because it weakens the United States as a leader in the world. So I would think that that aspect is really more about the political warfare uh, nature. Now, the critical infrastructure you described, uh, I would not necessarily put it in that same category. Uh, I would say that the operation Dragonfly 2.0, which I went through, and the reason I did, I'd like to emphasize that I, I felt I was losing emphasis on sophistication of the operation, uh, the demonstration of that by Russia. Uh, that was not necessarily meant to be found. It was found. Uh, so how we uncovered the Russians in that campaign was not quite released, uh, just that we did, okay? Now, it could have sent a signal that we're in, that they're in our networks, all right, and they have that capability, which is part of deterrence. Uh, but I don't know if, you know, the Russians would do what you described, if I heard you correctly. They would probably not take down a power grid in New England just for some sort of a demonstration or a cause. They did that in Ukraine in a very minor case in a much smaller state on their periphery. I, I don't trust that they would do that in the United States. Uh, as I said, that could be seen as a use of force and could trigger a more substantial response. Uh, Ukraine, uh, again, uh, the attribution was suspect. I think the attribution was better in, in uh, not Dragonfly 2.0. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is, um, it looks like uh, US cyber capabilities have given us some ability to observe both uh, the tactics and the techniques of Russian cyber operations against the United States. And so, for example, the US has been able to indict both Russian GRU operatives as well as some affiliated non state actors for their participation in cyber operations against America. So, uh, what is your sense? I mean, do the Russian actors simply not care that there is at least some American capability to monitor them, what they're doing? and then identify them, which could potentially limit the success of their operations? Uh, various firms uh, have said, uh, after the 2016 elections, uh, CrowdStrike, I believe, uh, specifically said the Russians don't care. They don't even care if you find them because they're so good and they move so quickly that, and they have such an array of tools that they'll just move on to another vector as you're attempting to stop them. So, you know, if you find them in your networks, then uh, there's no guarantee that you will uh, be successful at defeating them unless you have the appropriate tools in place. So what I was describing in the defensive mechanisms, when I was giving you the sample of endpoint detection response technologies by Palo Alto uh, and Cortex, gives you the ability to actually defeat the attack as the attack is ongoing. And in some cases, you might not even know who it is you see those scripts running, uh, you know they're coming from the wrong place, they're doing things they're not supposed to be doing, and you defeat them. So in some cases, you don't even have the attribution, it's Russian, you just know you're under attack. Mm -hmm. So we have to sometimes think twice about, you know, uh, the actor on the network. You know, we might, first of all, we might not even know it's Russia on the network until we have really a lot of uh, time to try to ascertain their techniques and correlate them back to common use tactics. Uh, or we uh, might uh, not know uh, that the Russians uh, are there. And, and don't think that just because we find malware on a computer in another country, it's the Russians. Uh, there could be other actors, uh, which we do. You know, we might go to a, a NATO partner, uh, look for tactics and techniques, uh, as you're alluding to, and see all kinds of bad people there. 
the Chinese, the Iranians, and so forth, uh, running scripts and so forth. And it would take a while to try to figure out who's who. Now, uh, the second part of the question that, again, I think is actually separate is the indictment piece. Uh, and that is that, no, uh, the Russians don't care that uh, we're indicting them uh, because we have no ability, unless they travel outside the Russian uh, country to arrest them. And even then it would have to be to a country that we have a mutual legal uh, agreement with. This has happened in places such as the Maldives, Israel, and so forth. But anybody that is getting indicted by Russia would hopefully be smart enough or at least directed not to leave the country. So uh, that's not going to happen. And secondly, as I allude to in the book, uh, there are known cases where the Russians have actually recruited hackers that have been indicted. They did this in the Yahoo case where they welcome the capability of an indicted hacker, not a government hacker, but a private hacker, a criminal, into the government to capitalize on that individual's capabilities. So I don't think you're going to find the indictments necessarily. They send a message, uh, which is part of name and shame, part of deterrence, but not necessarily they're, are they going to be effective. All right. Well, let me ask the next question, which is, you know, we don't have a situation now where there are established concrete cyber norms as to how states should behave in the cyber world. And my guess is, uh, my own view is that that would be fairly difficult to do. Uh, but do you think that if uh, the U.S. pursues this defend forward approach that you uh, described, uh, that it would reduce the amount of cyber attacks that are against the United States in the absence of those norms, or might it in fact increase the attacks as the Russians in fact up the game? You know. Just like the indictments, uh, one of the concerns on indicting Russian hackers is that they'll indict our hackers. Okay, so you know uh, it is a potential outcome of Defend Forward if, uh, by the nature of the operation, uh, the Russians were to ascertain who it is that's inside uh, their networks. In theory, they could ha they could indict our uh, citizens, and uh, if our citizens were to leave the United States, they could be at risk of being arrested. Now, that is not talked about a whole lot because the risk of escalation in some fashion, whether it be indictments or even some sort of a intrusion upon our networks increased by the Defend Forward, uh, could definitely increase escalation. Now, we're probably going under the guys that are already in our networks, okay? And we have the proof, right? The DNC networks, the utilities, and so forth, they're here. They're, they are already forward, the Russian. They're forward already. And uh, we, have, we know that because they're in our networks. So now we're basically saying we're going to be in theirs. And there has been some, again, releases showing that. The New York Times uh, a few months ago released an article saying that uh, uh, the United States uh, was in Russian power grid, and uh, which the Russians came back and said that it was a potential act of war. Uh, that is a form of escalation itself. But uh, I think we did that uh, because we wanted to communicate that we also had that capability to be in their grids, just like they have been revealed to be in ours. So uh, the answer is, uh, yes, there can be more escalation, uh, but most of what we're doing, the examples I gave are, are kind of uh, on the down low side of any kind of cyber activity, right? I gave you two examples, messaging uh, and what were just denial of service type attacks. So uh, reversible type attacks, I would state. So part of that is not have escalation. Okay, let me move on to the next question and is, uh, you know, obviously, the Russians are targeting some American allies and partners, as well as the United States itself. Uh, and you described the defend forward strategy. Uh, th this may not be an easy question to answer, but uh, would that defend forward involve, in fact, penetrating allies, networks, in order to try to capture the Russians before they do more damage? You know, and if so, are, are there some sort of cooperative mechanism set up with allies and partners uh, that would allow that? So the question is whether or not we will be in allies or partner networks in order to do conduct the operations that transpire. 
Uh, to def help defend against Russian operations. Right. Well, uh, I cannot speak to, to uh, any public uh, instances uh, where that has uh, been transcribed uh, in the case of Defend Ford in regard to Russian operations. Uh, I will say that uh, during operations against ISIS, this came up in the Obama administration that in order for the United States Cyber Command to conduct uh, operations against ISIS uh, to include taking their social media offline or interfering with some of their fighters' activities in cyberspace, it was recognized by the Obama administration that there might be a need to go into the networks of some of our friends, uh, which would seem to make sense because if uh, for example, an operative is in Germany operating on local uh, networks, then we would have to penetrate into German networks. Mm -hmm. So that was brought up and was considered. Uh, I know the operations proceeded. I don't know the extent of notifying uh, the various countries. Uh, I believe that occurred, but I can't say. I don't know for a fact. Uh, from my memory. Uh, I don't know about mechanisms to do that. Uh, that would be under the guise of the various uh, relations that we have with our uh, partners uh, and our allies. And uh, and some of that could be in the classified realm that I'm not, I'm not aware of and of course would not be a liberty to speak to. Okay, and another question that goes on. H have you observed or has the U.S. observed any differences in or trends in the types of operations that are conducted by the Russian government, as opposed to non-state actors that may have been delegated certain tasks by the Russian governments. Do the Russians give the non-state actors a certain set of things to do and then reserve for themselves other types of operations? Okay, so uh, the best example of that uh, was in 2015 and the power grid uh, uh, incursion, uh, incursion into uh, Ukraine, uh, there were some discussions by the analysts who studied it that uh, parts of the operation could have been conducted by criminals. So maybe some of the early spear phishing uh, as an example. So you could have a delegation to criminals uh, for various types of activity. Uh, you also see, for example, uh, the use of criminal botnets uh, I mentioned in the Georgian attack, I said there were six command and control servers, came online, managed by a, a criminal uh, a cyber crime group. Uh, those were believed to be actually like a DDoS for hire type group. So maybe in that case, they were hired to conduct the DDoS attacks. Uh, so that part of the operation was given to them. Okay, there's no proof that the Russian government did that which I said in that case, in some cases, makes it difficult to attribute to the government, which makes it difficult to attribute as an international wrongful act, just by countermeasures. I've made that connection, right? So there are sections of operations that maybe are delegated to say criminals. Uh, that could be the case. Uh, a lot of the APTs, advanced persistent threat groups, 28, 29, cozy bear, fancy bear, are most likely just subunits of the government. In some cases, we don't even seem to attribute to them by that name anymore. We just say the GRU, as we did in not pet yet. We just said the GRU did it when we sanctioned them, as I mentioned. So there could be some of that, uh, but I'd say it's more of a delegation uh, of capability is what I would allude to there. Well, let me combine the next two questions. The first part would be, what costs, aside from name and shame, have been imposed on the Russians? And I think you've already addressed that a bit, but if you could go into a bit more detail. And then the second question would be is, you know, the Russians, I think, as you discussed, have not seemed to be much deterred by what the United States and the West have done in response over the past few years. So, you know, aren't we, in fact, behind there? And, you know, what are the prospects that we could actually catch up to the point and get ahead of the Russians? Uh, where, in fact, we could begin to exert some meaningful deterrence. And there was a quote that uh, General Nakasomi said to uh, Congress uh, right after 
about 2018 that the, the Russians don't fear us. There's no, and I was actually going to say that in my presentation. I started realizing how, how much my time is at. Uh, you know, the, the question is, uh, what kind of cost? Well, we've done things to the Russians diplomatically, as I've alluded to, by uh, uh, kicking some of their operatives out of the country. We shut down facilities. Uh, we issued indictments, uh, sanctions. Uh, we have, for example, which I did, did not have time to talk about, uh, we did put sanctions on a lot, on a number of their oligarchs. Uh, in the 2018 time frame, and uh, that did have an immediate impact on their economy uh, and some of their net worth. So I think of all the things the United States has done, that's been one of the most significant actions that we've taken uh, in going after the source of the funding and uh, some of the uh, that for these activities. Uh, uh, for example, the IRA is. Uh, uh, supported, sponsored by one of uh, Putin's inner circle oligarchs. I don't know the name off the top of my head, and I'd probably mispronounce it anyway, which I might have done during the presentation that I apologize for if I did. But uh, uh, so we have done some things that have made an effect, right? The, the, the question is a lasting effect uh, that would change the way uh, the Russians operate. And, and you mentioned norms, uh, which I don't think I got to a full discussion on. You know, the United States uh, is encouraging like-minded nations to sign up for norms of behavior. The Russians are part of the discussion. They are leading uh, a working group right now, the open-ended working group under the UN, to look at norms. But the Russians are concentrating along with other of uh, their like-minded uh, states on uh, aspects of cyberspace, more for internal security, right, uh, than external security more for control over their populations. So we haven't been able to make significant progress in norms. The Russians signed up for the norms that they violated uh, in 2015 when they attacked, most likely they, the Russians, into Georgia. They had agreed to a norm the previous summer not to attack critical infrastructure. And they did it anyway. And that's why I stated on slide two, they're undermining norms. Uh, so we need to keep at it, the United States. We need to keep uh, attempting to name and shame the whole bad actors such as Russia and the other uh, contenders to norms. But it just it takes a whole government approach. And you actually then jump, jumped ahead and also addressed the next question, which was about the possibility for crafting some kind of regime of rules of the road in the cyber world uh, that you know, might provide, you know, some restraints on how governments react. I don't know if you want to add anything further. Uh, it sounds like you don't see, I guess I, I wouldn't describe your previous comments as being optimistic in that area, but you know, could, could you maybe comment a little bit more? Well, I like to be optimistic. Uh, and the United States has the second uh, working group ongoing. Uh, that working group is more of a mirror of the previous groups that is uh, more limited uh, in its, uh, uh, population of experts. Uh, and uh, when they put out their report, uh, which is their mandate, in another year or so, hopefully it will have some sort of consensus with major players that we can get toward where abiding by norms. So I'm not saying uh, at all that norms don't work. And I think the 2015 norm not to attack critical infrastructure was clear enough uh, because it did not delineate specific tactics just said don't do it no uh and this is the same as space you know uh you know we've been somewhat successful in thinking about norms in space uh that i talk about in classes uh not to interfere with space assets no. we keep it very vague so that you don't have to have too many aspects of terms that can be misconstrued and so forth so I do think norms can work. The challenge is holding the states responsible to the norms. And the name and shame, where you identify, you tribute, expose, uh, is part of that. And we just haven't been successful at conveying that message. Uh, and some of the reasons I gave today is because the Russians are operating below the level of armed conflict, as I said here, the boundary in the book. 
and uh, uh, and they're using a lot of techniques which allow them to not be attributed pretty quickly at least, uh, as I said. So uh, we just need to get better at it. Uh, it being our defenses and our uh, ability to detect, uh, to monitor, to attribute, uh, these sort of things in a timely manner. You described the variety of Russian cyber operations, including misinformation and disinformation against the United States and the West. And, and when you look at, when you break them down and divide them by subject matter or timing or target audiences, do you see some operations that are more effective in terms of impact than others? And if so, which ones work and which ones seem to be not working? And, and are the Russians learning then and sort of reorganizing how they target their cyber ops? I would say that, uh, it, well, it depends. Okay, so let's look at the uh, French elections 2017 uh, that I had this short bullet on and I had a statement on how the Russians interfered there, right? Well, their candidate uh, did not win, okay? So whatever the Russians did in trying to uh, expose uh, the candidacy of, uh, of the winner uh, <clears throat> did not, not work, okay? So the Russians have not always been quite successful, okay? Uh, they were favoring Le Pen instead of Macron, and she did not win. They even politically had given money to her campaign, uh, from my understanding, uh, part of political warfare, and again, she did not win the election. So the Russians have not always been successful in their various endeavors under this term active measures, whether it be disinformation, leaking fake documents from the Macron campaign, or maybe even uh, politically propping up the opposition candidate. Uh, the operations in the 2016 election did seem to have an effect, although the United States has not publicly said that uh, because the Russians did not alter the vote. Now, an individual reading the reports has to make a decision on whether the Russians were successful in changing the outcome of the election. In other words, who won? Did President, did Trump or Clinton win, uh, and you can make a determination yourself based on the type of disinformation campaign. Did it change the mind of the voters? Did it keep some voters at home uh, from not even participating uh, by going after certain groups? Uh, so there is a, a message there that the Russians can be successful, but uh, by exposing their techniques, by more public awareness, uh, maybe they won't be successful again. Uh, we'll see. We'll see in the 2020 election coming up. You talked about the importance, and, I, and other people who talk about this uh, on the cyber side as well, stress the need for resilience. I mean, the stronger and more defendable and more resilient you make your own systems, the better you are to withstand cyber operations. So as you look at uh, sort of US networks, um, which areas are most vulnerable? Where, where should we be paying more attention um, that, that we're not looking at now? The attacks uh, that I, most of the attacks I alluded to today are, uh, they start on basically the victim's endpoint. That's what I was saying. I mean, in, in fact, uh, what, what has occurred is an individual has been tricked to somehow allow uh, the perpetrator, in this case the Russians, to act inside their machine to move across the network. So in reality, uh, the gambit of actions I was talking about today, whether it be a hack into the DCC in order to get to the DNC, whether it be a hack into a, a utility provider to get into an actual uh, a vendor to get into a utility, the action starts inside of some victim's computer and then moves across the network, breaking out, as I alluded to that term. Mm -hmm. So the first line of defense is to shore up our defenses at the individual workstations, the laptops, the desktops, and so forth of our employees and our 
various companies or organizations or agencies and so forth. So uh, the two slides I gave you on technical solutions to withstand and investigate an attack through advanced tech to uh, different types of data co correlation technologies was intended to demonstrate how we can detect this sort of activity as difficult as it is to see uh, on these devices. So I would say that's one of our weak points. Uh, now there's other ways to attack networks like DDoS attacks, and those are other sort of vendor solutions that there are a number of companies that are dedicated and protecting today some of our federal agencies from those sort of attacks. Uh, so I'm not saying that those are necessarily a weak point, mm -hmm. which is the other primarily Russian tactic like we saw in Estonia, Georgia, and so forth. So I think we need to work at, uh, at the device level inside the network in order to shore up in, in our defenses to make them more resilient, as you say. Okay, Russia has been working on and making some progress developing a sovereign Russia net. Right. Uh, and do you fear the possibility that we might see more aggressive or more spectacular Russia cyber attacks against the United States or the West as the Russians have an ability to, you know, disconnect uh, or separate their internet system and therefore avoid uh, retaliatory cyber attacks? That would be uh, probably speculative to try to come to any conclusion there. Uh, I, the Russians did establish their own internet. They did test the ability to disconnect a few months ago. Uh, that's in the public uh, domain. Uh, but you would say their, their reasons are uh, that if they go into more of a cyber war uh, with uh, another country, such as uh, Western countries or NATO, that they'd have the ability to not be dependent on the World Wide Web internally. So uh, they did that for that reason. I, I don't think that that would embolden them to do more below the level of armed conflict type attacks, knowing that they could wall off their own uh, nation uh, that could be conceived. But I, I think that, again, that's more speculative. Uh, you know, you could probably look a little bit more at uh, other reasons they might have done that. Uh, for example, to maybe isolate their own population, uh, such as China has done with their own uh, internal internet. So again, the Russians are very concerned about internal security messaging to their population and maybe they could choose at some point to shut down access to the outer world and control filter content internally i'd have to look at a number of reasons they built that not to come to a conclusion that it's just so they can do more cyber attacks okay great okay well, we you we've talked i think you, you've made the point that most western sanctions if they've had a short-term impact, have not had the desired long-term impact of sort of dissuading the Russians from backing off of these operations. So, you know, are there particular sanctions that you think would be more effective in getting Russia to stop or at least ratchet down the intensity of their cyber operations? That's a tough one. Uh, because the question would be, you know, uh, how do sanctions uh, affect our own economy, right? So the United States government in deciding upon sanctions would, I, uh, I believe, would consider the impact upon our own population, just like in tariffs and other things we do. And in some cases, uh, back to the oligarch sanctions, uh, a couple of the same, uh, one of the, in particular, uh, a couple of the companies that we sanctioned uh, in particular, RUSAL, R-U-S-A-L, is an aluminum conglomerate, and that was sanctioned as a property of one of the oligarchs. Uh, well, when we did that, uh, the price of aluminum skyrocketed, and there were a number of cases where companies were going bankrupt around the world uh, because of that sanction. So the United States, uh, just about six months after we issued those sanctions, we actually backed that off for that particular company. 
So because of that reason. So uh, I would say that looking at what's harder, you know, I mean, where do you get tougher sanctions upon maybe economic interests and these sort of things could have an effect back against uh, the, the economy of, uh, of the West. And of course, you know, let's not forget that uh, Europe is still heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas. So, you know, that's a very difficult road to go down, I would think. Uh, and the Treasury Department definitely has uh, some difficult choices to make that, I, that I'm not privy to. Okay, great. Well, I think that exhausts uh, the questions. I think we've had a really good discussion, a great chance to dig into this issue. Scott, let me uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you for the opportunity, Steve, and also to the organizations.